What's up, everybody? Welcome to System Crafters. I'm David Wilson, and today we are going to uh, answer the question of what is system crafting? So um, whenever I started working on Emacs videos, uh, I kind of wanted to change the direction of the channel that I had created long ago where I was making videos about uh, programming languages, etc. I didn't really do very many of those, but uh, the, the idea was that um, I've been spending a lot of time in the past year sort of really focusing on my own system configuration and my own usage of Emacs to kind of build it into a system that I was very excited about. And uh, I wanted to focus on that idea in my new channel. So I was trying to think of a name that would exemplify uh, this whole idea of uh, sort of crafting your own uh, system, your own system configuration. And obviously, when I say that, the, the name becomes pretty obvious, which is uh, System Crafters. So it's basically just is I, I want to come up with a name that um, described a group of people and specifically the kind of people who are, are computer configuration enthusiasts or people who really enjoy uh, tweaking their configuration, trying new programs, seeing how to put them together and just making their whole computing environment more personal to them. So um, that's where the name came from. And that's sort of what we're trying to do in this channel is to promote this idea of, you know, having this, this craft or this hobby of, you know, being, uh, or, or, or just doing com computer configuration and just building the kind of system that you think is the best for you. So um, you are probably here because you have found my Emacs videos. And generally the people who are inclined to try Emacs are the people who are curious about uh, this kind of thing anyway, because Emacs is probably one of the more configurable programs in existence and uh, it lends itself well to being able to craft your your whole environment because you have control over pretty much anything you want to have in Emacs and there's plenty of things that it, that it can do that can uh, take the place of other programs that you use in your life so uh, since you are probably this type of person I, I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of system crafting in this video so that maybe we can all have a shared understanding of why we're talking about these topics on this channel and sort of where we plan to go with it in the future. So let's go into a little bit more detail about what uh, system crafting means, at least to me. So so why would you do this? Why, why would you spend so much time trying to craft your computing configuration and, to, and make it something that's really sort of uh, uh, tailored to you? Well, uh, the, the biggest thing to me, at least, is like that satisfaction of learning something new and uh, to be creative in using that knowledge that you've gained. So whenever you uh, learn a new tool or learn a new sort of environment, I guess, like if you're in GNU Linux or, you know, learning, you know, Emacs or Vim, etc. I don't know, there's, there's just that sort of feeling you get from it whenever there's so, so, so many new interesting things to learn. And then when you start to learn them, you start to gain this sense of power, like you can do so many things with the tool that you're learning. Um, and then just being creative with it, you know, like learning new ways to use a tool that, that you've, uh, you've picked up. It, there's just something about it to me, at least, that just makes me feel really good. It's like a really nice hobby to have, you know. And not only is it a hobby, it's something that applies to any work that you do. So for me, the stuff that I do with my system configuration, I'm using it at my job every day, and uh, using it for any of my own personal creative projects and, and coding projects, etc. So not only is it a hobby that is enjoyable in its own right, it also results in a usable thing that is basically like an environment that's tailored to the way that you think and work. You know, you, you've you made something that works the way that you think. Um, also, be doing this kind of thing enables you to express your aesthetics as a person. So aesthetics is not just about um, the the way something looks, though some, the way something looks also does have a, a large part to play in it. It's also about um, the way that you want to use a computer, the way that you feel that, you know, information should be presented, uh, lots of things like that. So uh, coming up with your own configuration for not only for a single program, but for your entire system gives you that ability to express your aesthetics in terms of how things how things should look like in terms of whether it should be like minimalistic or maybe big and bold, or maybe like you have colors that are very bright, or maybe they, they're more, you know, muted, you know, that sort of low contrast versus high contrast kind of thing. And uh, also whether you focus on typography or maybe images, 
Uh, there's lots of different dimensions on which you can express your personal aesthetics uh, whenever you are creating your system configuration, you know, with, with, with the tools that you pick. And uh, another thing that a lot of people are interested in in terms of making their own system config is ensuring their freedom and privacy. So with a lot of the sort of mainstream programs and operating systems today, um, we are, I guess you could say you're, you're losing more and more of your freedom and privacy as time goes on because things are not really standalone programs anymore. Many of them are connect, connected to cloud services. And um, as you use these programs, they may give data about you back to the people who make the programs. And a lot of times this is just to make the um, to, to give information to the developers so that they know how to improve the program in the future. But still, you know, it's not just a program running on your computer anymore. It's a program that's connected to something in the cloud. And, you know, it, it makes sense to me for some people to not really feel comfortable with that. So coming up with your own system configuration, choosing your tools carefully gives you that ability to ensure your own freedom and privacy. Uh, and if you use a lot of the tools in like, let's say the, the GNU tool set or just in the, the free software space, many of those tools are going to respect your freedom and privacy because that's sort of like the principles on which those tools are created. So um, whenever you get on this path of doing system configuration and really sort of going deep in the tools that you use, uh, in my opinion, all roads eventually lead to GNU Linux. Um, GNU Linux is uh, the most um choice centric operating system that you could pick because if you're using windows or mac os you don't necessarily have so many choices in the way that things are presented they you know the the companies that produce these programs have decided how you should use a computer and all the the tools that are on there are sort of they fit into this model which is fine because many people just want to use a computer to get stuff done and they don't really think too much about you know how they could do it differently but the people who are here, the people who are watching this right now, are probably the type of people who are not satisfied with that because they think the computer can do more and can do things the way that they want. Uh, like for me, I feel more uh, productive in a GNU Linux system than I do on Windows or on Mac OS because I have more control about what th how things work. And I understand more about how the system works because I've done more effort to set up the system myself and to understand the, the parts that, that put it together. So... Um, you, the, the freedom of the GNU Linux combo is just unmatched. There's, there's just no other way you can get that level of freedom. Um, it, it gives you this platform for d building your own ideal environment and that you know you have this endless array of, of programs that you can choose from that all have their own pros and cons. They all have their own uh, use cases and you can just pick and choose. You can just go on, into any package repository for any Linux distribution and just look and see what tools are there. You can go find information online and just picking through all those pieces, learning the different tools involved, trying out different things, you can decide what works best for you for what you want to do, and then uh, build a configuration that is very focused on the way that you want to use a computer. So uh, I think that ultimately, if you really like configuring, let's say your editor or other programs that you use, and you haven't tried to use GNU, GNU Linux, you should definitely give it a shot at some point, because it's going to give you the level of power and control that you really wish you had with the computer, the operating systems that you're currently using. So let's talk about foundational components. If you wanted to build your own system configuration in GNU Linux, what would you need to, uh, to be able to do that? Well, first of all, you're going to have to choose a Linux distribution. And somehow I just broke the head headline here. Uh, you, you're going to need to choose a Linux distribution. And I'm not going to go into very deep detail on this right now. Um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, Linux distributions and, and my opinions on which ones you should use, definitely uh, leave a note in the comments and I'll be happy to make another video about that in the future. Uh, but just at a high level, I kind of look at it in terms of three categories. And other people will have their own opinions on what the categories are, but I'm just breaking it down like this for the sake of this conversation. Uh, first of all, is there's the mainstream Linux distributions like Ubuntu, Debian, Fedora, etc., which are very easy for someone to set up and use because they are meant to be used by a more broad audience. So uh, if you try to install Ubuntu or Fedora, it's going to be very easy to set up because it's going to have all the drivers needed for the, um, the hardware in your computer. It's going to have a lot of good software available, and they're also going to be very stable because these are more broadly maintained um, and I guess, more conservative distributions. I would say Ubuntu is probably more conservative than Fedora. Fedora does have more of a rolling release kind of thing going on, uh, but it's still pretty stable. But if you want something that's very stable and uh, gives you access to a lot of software, Ubuntu is a good choice. 
Debian may be a little bit harder if you have uh, proprietary hardware that doesn't fall under the um, the free software guidelines because it is more of a free software distribution. But it's a great distribution if you want something that's more in line with that, but still as stable as something like Ubuntu. Then you have the more technical set of uh, Linux distributions like uh, Arch Linux and all of its derivatives, uh, like Manjaro and Void and many others that, that are like that. And then Gentoo, which is basically the, the distribution that's notorious for having you basically compile every application that you install. Uh, however, it does give you a lot of power whenever you do that. So these are great if you want to feel like you have a lot more understanding about how your distribution is put together because it, both in the case of Arch and Gentoo, the installation pro pro process is a lot more arduous. You have to set things up yourself. You basically start from a terminal in the installer and you have to run all the commands for partitioning your disks and setting up your networks and a lot of things like that. And you start with a blank system almost. So uh, they're great if you really want to get into the, the nitty gritty about how Linux works and to learn a lot. But if you're just starting out with Linux, I would not use these just yet because they're going to be difficult. However, if you want to dive right in and learn a lot, you will learn a lot from using these. So I don't want to discourage people who are new to Linux. But if you want to get started in a more comfortable fashion, I would definitely go with like Ubuntu or Fedora instead. Um, now the third category of Linux distribution is the kind that is more interesting to me because it gives you the ability to have a system configuration that is repeatable and uh, something that you can check into source control and sort of lock in. So these are NixOS and GNU Geeks. Um, so both of these are considered functional package managers and the reason why is because you uh, create a declarative configuration for your system and then you apply it and every time that you apply your configuration or change the configuration and apply it you're creating a new generation of your system configuration and what this means is that uh, if your new generation your new changes to your configuration or maybe the new versions of packages that you've installed if they break your system then you can easily roll back to a previous generation and the reason why is because the the installation of packages on your system, um, they don't get, like the old versions don't get thrown away. They're still there, but you have a new folder where the new versions of everything are installed. This is this concept of the immutable package store. I don't want to go into detail about that because it's kind of technical, but the idea is that um, it's very easy to roll back to a previous configuration because of the way these package managers and systems work. Um, so as opposed to something like Arch and Gentoo, if you install a new package update, it could very well break your system and it's hard to revert back to a previous state. But with NixOS and GNU Geeks, it's much easier to roll back, but you still have that power of being able to fully customize your system and have it be exactly what you want without a whole bunch of extra stuff installed like you might get with these uh, more mainstream distributions. Uh, we're gonna go into a lot more depth on GNU Geeks at least in this channel this year, and I will cover NixOS as well at some point because I think they're both interesting uh, and they're, they're both similar in a lot of ways and they solve a lot of the same problems, but for me, GNU Geeks is a little bit more interesting. So the next thing that you would probably look into for your foundational components would be the desktop environment or at the very least a window manager. So and there's a lot of uh, full desktop environments on, uh, on Linux. Uh, the most obvious ones being GNOME, KDE, and then like XFCE, Mate, LXDE, LXQT, etc. The list goes on. There's, there's plenty to choose from. They all have their own strengths and weaknesses. They all have their own look and feel. So, you know, it's cool to play with a lot of those. And the good thing about many of these is there's, you know, live CDs that you can download on the internet where you can just boot up with a CD or with a USB stick and just try them out without having to install them yourself. Um, they provide a lot of functionality, a lot of things that you would expect from a mainstream operating system. So they can be a good starting point if you're just getting into Linux and you want to kind of get your bearings before you start going into more detail about customizing things yourself. Uh, but eventually you're going to get interested in how things could be a little bit more curated. And if you want to do that, the better option is to start with a window manager, a more minimalistic window manager, and then pull in whatever tools that you need to complete your desktop environment. Um, and I should also add a very important window manager to this list that I forgot, EXWM. So um, the idea there is that you th these window managers all have their own way of managing windows. So the, the difference between a window manager and a desktop environment is that a window manager is literally only about managing the program windows that appear on the screen, like basically the placement of them, how you move them around, 
uh, what key bindings you can use to manage them, that sort of thing. So it's, it's purely just about how you place and manage windows. Uh, desktop environment is everything else in, in addition to window management where you have like, you know, your, your applications list and your system tray and uh, your software updating and a lot of other programs that are needed for like general use. But if you don't really care about all those things and you find them to be bloat or extra, you can just use a plain window manager and then pull in whatever, whatever tools you need. From this point, this is where you can start to build your own custom config. Uh, if you use something like i3 or Awesome, DWM, etc., you have a very simple basis to go from to then pull in the tools that you care about and then craft your configuration from, from that level. So uh, this is one of the more interesting aspects of making your own config is to try some of these different window managers and see which one sort of fits with your mental model of how to manage windows and your, your sort of desired workflow. And... Uh, and basically just try to find a way to use your computer using these. Uh, we talked about EXW, EXWM already on this channel. Eventually, I would like to talk about some of these other window managers to sort of show the pros and cons of them, but that will probably be farther down the road because we've got a lot of things to cover be between now and then anyway. Uh, obviously, the another thing that's going to be a foundational component is what editor you use. Uh, maybe some people don't agree with this, but you know, if you're going to be tweaking configuration files, you need something to edit them with. So um, there's a lot of different editors you could use on Linux, but to me, really the only two that matter in the end are Emacs or Vim. Uh, this is the age-old holy war of which one of these is the best. Um, I don't have a, an opinion about which is the best because they, they both have pros and cons. They, they both have their own use cases. And I would say that there is um, a distinct difference in workflow in both of them and, and perspective. So I want to do a video on this specific topic later, but I'm not going to go into that right now. What I will say that is that either of those two choices is going to uh, be the right choice for you, depending on what it is that you want. So um, they have big implications on how you will craft your system, basically how they interoperate with other tools and uh, how you would use them in your day-to-day -day workflow. So um, I, I would say that it's good to try both. I mean, probably you're here because you already know about Emacs and you're trying it out, but you should try Vim at some point too, just to see what you think about it. I mean, there's obviously the terminal mode of Vim, then there's also GVim for the graphical mode. Uh, there's also a more modern iteration of Vim being developed called NeoVim, that might be interesting and I might cover that in a future video, but um, it's good to take a look at these and see how they can help you because it's another way that you'll uh, really increase your productivity on the computer, especially when you're editing files and documents, etc. And then finally, there's just all the miscellaneous tools that you'll need and many of these things can be picked uh, for their qualities that you like, like mail tools, chat tools, uh, music players, file syncing, uh, login managers, like whenever you log into your computer, there's a screen that shows up first. There's many of those you can choose from. Uh, also, even session managers, which is kind of a, a more hidden thing that um, you get for free from the big desktop environments. But when you start using your own window manager or a, a more minimal window manager with no desktop, env desktop environment, you need to have some kind of session manager to help like setting fonts, icon themes, screen DPI, etc. like that. Uh, I thought icon themes. Is that what I said? I, I, I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. So um, there, there's all these tools that you will want to choose from eventually to, uh, to kind of craft your system to hone in on a more minimal and specific configuration that you have come up with. And it may take time to look through all these tools and figure out which ones you like. I'm going to try to provide you with some recommendations on this channel over time, but it's a lot of fun to go try to find what's out there and, and learn a lot about things that are, are available to you. Uh, if it's not something that you really feel excited about doing, then I understand. Uh, and you, you, should, you could definitely go just look for what the most popular tools are and just try those and just stick with them. All right, so another thing that's great about this sort of craft or hobby of uh, creating your own system configuration is the cultivating and sharing of what you've made. Um, so obviously at some point you're gonna wanna keep the configuration that you've made. Uh, so that requires like checking it into source control or syncing it somehow. Um, at least when you check it in the source control, you have it locked in so that er anytime you make changes to the, the configuration, you make a new commit, and then you can see sort of that history of changes you made over time. And in case maybe you made a change that broke something, you can easily revert back to a previous uh, change that you made in your commit history. 
Uh, that's going to be very important whenever you start trying different programs because you don't want to have like a previous configuration that you came up with for some program and then like change your key bindings or change something important about it and then lose what you had before. You definitely want to be checking in your configurations to source control so that you have that history and that ability to go back in time a little bit. Um, then also it's great for being able to share your configuration with other people. So if you check it into a Git repository and then pu uh, publish it to a public Git repo, like on GitHub or on GitLab or any other Git service that you like, you can share your configuration with other people. Like if someone asks, well, how do I use this program? You can just go to your repository, find those lines in your config and send it to somebody, which is pretty cool. I do that pretty often. Um, it makes it so that you can kind of uh, build up this uh, knowledge about all the programs that you use that to share with other people. And then it's, it's kind of nice to be able to just go look at your repo and see that, you know, you have all your configuration there. And maybe if you start to get a little bit more in depth with how you organize your configuration, like for instance, with using org mode, like we do, uh, in some videos on this channel, um, you can, you know, basically write about your configuration as you're placing it into the files that show up on your repo so that other people can learn how you did it and how you think about your config. And also it's good documentation for you for the future. So, um, there is, that's another fun part of all of this. Whenever you really start getting into it is being able to share your configuration and see it build over time. So what's the ideal strategy for trying to learn how to get into this whole craft of system crafting? Um, well, I would say start wherever you are the most comfortable. Like if you're just moving from windows or Mac OS to Linux, just try to, to, to go step by step. Don't try to jump in too head first because it's going to be hard to find your footing. You know, start with, by finding a more comfortable distro, maybe try to learn more about customizing your editor of choice. And then from there, start to spread out to other programs that you use regularly and try to try some alternatives. And then maybe like try some window managers at some point and see how those work for you. Uh, over time, you're going to learn so much that it's going to be easier the next steps that you take. So uh, definitely don't try to jump in too much in the beginning to the deep end. Also, I would say it's a good practice to use the tools that you're choosing for a little while, maybe a couple of weeks to a month before you move on to something else, because what you really want to do is to learn the mindset of the tools that you're using and um, to learn how they work so that you can form your own preferences and uh, understand what you're looking for whenever you try to look for a new tool uh, in the future if, this, if the current one doesn't work out for you. So it's very important to just give them a little bit of a chance to understand them before you move on to the next thing. Uh, also, while you're doing this, it's great to follow good content sources. Um, you know, there's lots of people on Twitter that tweet about, you know, system configuration, Linux, Emacs, Vim, etc. Uh, on Reddit, there's plenty of subreddits for all the editors and all the window managers and all the Linux distributions, pretty much anything you're interested in, there's going to be a subreddit for that. There's people posting links all the time and having conversations. So that can be really helpful. Um, then there's, you know, a multitude of blogs on the internet. Obviously, you can get a lot of things from there, a lot of configuration examples. And then videos on channels like this one on YouTube and, you know, like there's the DistroTube channel and there's many, many other channels about Linux and system configuration on YouTube. So uh, you can get a lot of ideas from, from those places as well. Uh, basically, any of those things can give you a lot of new ideas and uh, tell you about programs you may not have heard of because one problem we have in this space is there's often these nice niche tools that you won't ever hear of until someone tells you about them because you won't know how to find them or they're just not really marketed very well. So uh, being... Uh, plugged into these content sources will be good for learning about new things. And then lastly, just join communities where people trade ideas. So, you know, if it's like an IRC server or a mailing list, uh, you know, Reddit is a good example of that. And even like Discord servers, like the, the System Crafters Discord server, if you check the link in the description, we, we talk about stuff there all the time about Linux distributions, about programs, Emacs, etc. cetera. Uh, just find a community where you feel comfortable asking questions and uh, sharing what you're doing. And that can help a lot with your own growth in trying to do all of this. And uh, you will find that the more that you sort of communicate with other people or you, the more that you see other people having conversations about things, the more that you will just sort of pick up from all that and you will learn a lot just from being there. You don't even have to, to engage with the discussion as much so long as you just sort of read what people are talking about and then just jump in and ask some questions every now and then. So um, I think that's a very good strategy to to sort of ramp up and to start doing this process of learning how to build your own configuration and then getting more comfortable, you know, refining it over time. So uh, the last thing I want to say is just like, are you interested in hearing more about this uh, overall idea, this overall topic? I'm, basically, the idea of this video was just to sort of, sort of expose you to the the idea of crafting your own system configuration. Um, and 
maybe set the stage for future videos where I talk more in depth about certain topics, maybe about Linux distributions or the, the varieties of tools that are out there. Um, if you're interested, definitely let me know in the comments and also share your own ideas about what you'd like to hear about so that we can maybe make future videos to discuss those. Um, so in the future, what I really want to do is branch out and talk about some alternate system configurations. Like what we're doing right now is very heavy on Emacs and GNU Geeks, but um, I would like to cover some alternatives maybe with different Linux distributions or like a, a full Vim and Tmux setup, things like that, just to sort of show the differences between them so that you have more options to choose from whenever you're doing your own system configuration work. So uh, definitely let me know in the comments if you're interested in any of that, and I will try to plan videos like that across uh, this year so we can talk more in depth about it. All right. Um, I think that's enough for this video for today. So the last thing I want to do is just to thank my sponsors. Uh, thank you much, so much to all of you who have decided to sponsor uh, my work on these videos on this channel. It really means the world to me to be able to make this content for you and to you know just share cool stuff that I learn about because it's basically all, all I'm doing. I'm doing what I'm talking about in this video right now and I'm just sharing what I'm learning with you. So it's great that people are excited about it and willing to sponsor the channel. Uh, if you're interested in also sponsoring the content that I'm making here, please feel free to check out the links in the description below. I'm on GitHub sponsors and on Patreon. There's also a link to PayPal for one-time donations if you'd prefer that, uh, that approach also. So until next time, um, definitely enjoy some system crafting of your own and uh, happy hacking. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.